What's up everybody, Peter McKinnon here. Welcome back to yet another video. And folks, today we're talking about the Canon R5. The highly anticipated, much discussed, rumored, all the buzz, and for a very good reason, because this camera delivers. I couldn't be more excited about it. Now, before we dive into this thing and I talk about my experience and show you some footage, because I have been shooting with it for a few months now, Canon sent me this camera on loan. I'm giving it back actually in a few hours uh, to test out basically in the middle of the pandemic. But I want you to know too, right at the beginning, I'm sponsored by Canon. I'm an ambassador for the brand. I'm a Canon shooter. I've been a Canon shooter my entire life. I've been shooting Canon since I bought my first professional DSLR. That's about 15 years now I've been using Canon products. So keep that in mind when I'm doing this review. I'm not gonna be unfair about it. If there are things I don't like about it, I'm gonna tell you. But luckily for this camera, it is exceptional and there's not a whole lot of things that I don't like about it. So you're excited, I'm excited. Let's talk about one of the biggest camera releases of the year of the is it of the decade could we say decade it's one of the biggest releases for Canon for sure this is back to the 5d mark II days let's talk about those days for a second hands up who remembers a filmmaker by the name of Vincent Laforé? amazing made a film called Reverie back in I'm gonna say it was like November 2008 with the 5d mark II. now this was one of the first times we'd seen cinematic looking footage with depth of field shot on a DSLR that was a big deal then you had heavy hitters like Philip Bloom coming out with incredible courses on how to use a DSLR as like a filmmaking camera and the right settings and the accessories and that will always be a staple in my mind learning from him when I was much younger. That was a big deal for Canon. That was a huge camera release, the 5D Mark II. The R5, I feel, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, the R5 is that big deal of a release now for Canon. Let's talk about why this camera is important, why people are talking about it, where all the buzz is coming from. Let me show you how this thing works. There's the top down angle. You've got your flip out screen that we've all come to love. The body's a little bit thicker than the EOS R. Not by a whole lot, but that's obviously accounting for the new in-body image stabilization. The wheel is back, the joystick is back. The functionality that a lot of us are used to coming from the DSLR side of things, it makes it faster, easier to use. It just feels right. Here's something that'll make a lot of people happy dual card slots. You've got a spot for a CF Express, which is the new type of like high speed card that this thing's taking. And then you have an SD card slot. It takes the same LPE6 batteries that we've all have like a hundred of. So that is a massive benefit. Now there are new ones. So they've got this little sticker on them. That's kind of how you're able to differentiate the uh, new ones from the old ones. And apparently it's just the software and the cameras is, is able to use this battery to just distribute the power in a more efficient way. It's not necessarily that the battery is bigger and giving you more battery life, but the camera and the software now is smarter and it's using these batteries better than the old ones. Same chargers, that's good. All right, so taking a look at the difference in comparison of size to the R5 and the R, here they are with the back button layout. Like I said, this bar is gone. You got your joystick here. Instead of your directional kind of D-pad sort of control, you've got the wheel. And other than that, they look pretty much the same. This R5 is just a little bit thicker. So if we look at them both side by side, a little bit fatter, grips a little bit bigger. We flip them over on the sides. This side right here is a really good representation of how much thicker it is. Most of everything in the same place. Another top down. Honestly, in my opinion, it feels better ergonomically. So now you've got IBIS in the body, you've got image stabilization in the lens, those two things working together to get you some super stable footage, something people have wanted for a long time. It's one of those instances where you're reading the stats online and you're like, it, this can't be true. Is this right? Does this do 8K raw? C-log with autofocus, 4K, 120? Yep. I mean, when we're even looking at all the modes on this camera, as far as how they're represented within the menu, Canon's menus have always been good, but the UI within how to get to different frame rates and resolutions has been improved even more. Now they've just broken it down into three menu options, basically. It's very clearly broken down here, which makes it a breeze to just go boop, 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 and you know exactly what you're setting. Now to get that high frame rate, you're still gonna go over to the other menu, hit high frame rate, enable, that's gonna go into 4K 120. 
photographers, 45 megapixels, right? I've been shooting on 20 megapixels with the 1DX Mark II for like a good quarter plus of my entire career. So 45 megapixels, that's great. That's some high res stuff right there. One of the things I love, I love the shutter sound and click of this camera. That's a big thing. If it's just like a nasty shutter sound and click, can't do it. This, that's subtle. Check this out. Shutter mode, electronic. Listen to this. I've literally just shot like 15 frames. There's so many times in photography where that shutter sound can actually be an issue. Wildlife photography, for example. If you're someone that's camping out and you're waiting for a hummingbird or you're waiting for an animal, <laughs> gone. With this, you're not even sure if you shot the frame, it's so silent. So that is amazing. You're shooting live events, weddings, any type of thing where, where people are talking and the focus is not on you, it's on something else. And you're needing to photograph that without being a distraction. Amazing. Frames per second wise, this thing is fast. So you're gonna get 12 frames per second mechanical. You're gonna get 20 frames per second when you're in live view. So it rips in live view mode. One, two, three. See the border right there? See that white frame just freaking out? That's how fast it's shooting. That was 130 photos I just snapped. You heard nothing. That's gotta be one of my favorite new features because I used that on the 1DX Mark III constantly. You're dropping something in a tank of water. You're shooting John Hill do a fakey 360 flip nose grind into a kickflip manual and shove it out. Switch. You want to capture these moments without having to worry about like, did I get it in frame? 20 frames per second? If you didn't get it in frame, there's a whole different issue. So let's talk about my experience using this R5 since Pete, you've clearly had it for quite some time now. Tell me what it's like. I know the specs, I see them, I've read them, all those things. How is the camera, dude? How is it? I'll start by saying I got this camera like in the thick of the lockdown. I didn't get a chance to use it as much as I wanted to because parks were closed, trails were closed, no one was going outside. So a lot of the use that I got from the R5 at the beginning for like the bulk of the time that I had it in my possession was stuff at home. Photographing the pets, photographing the kids, doing things like that around the house. Things that you do when you first get a camera at home and you open the box and you're like, uh, come here boy. It felt so good to shoot 120 frames per second again. Used it all the time on the 1DX Mark II. Got used to shooting 60p on the EOS R, but it was really good to shoot in 120 again and remember how good it looks and how good it looks in 4K insane. Now the version I have is a prototype version. It's not a finished production version. That's why it has the words sample on it. And this is the one I've had for a few months. So there were some quirks and things to it that I think will be ironed out when the launch version comes. And there was also a couple things that I was unsure of. Example, if you're shooting a lot of 4K 120, sometimes the camera starts to overheat and it gives you that overheat warning just so that the things inside don't melt and it doesn't get destroyed. When you think of a cinema series camera like the C500 and up, those all have huge fans built into them. But we're we're talking a mirrorless camera here. This is this is very small. This little thing doesn't have two giant fans cooling it down the entire time, so it gets hot. Of course, the more shooting that you do, you're gonna have to wait. So it makes sense to me that it overheats based off those settings that you're shooting at. For me though, that is one of the downsides. I understand having to wait for the camera to cool down. I don't wanna wait. I just wanna keep shooting. I don't think there's there's X. If you shoot this much, you have to wait this long because it's all situational. It's gonna depend on different conditions. Are you shooting in the jungle where it's super hot and humid and all you're doing is 8K and 4K 120? Are you shooting in the Arctic where it's the complete opposite? Are you not shooting much 4K 120? maybe just a few clips here and there. You're never gonna have an issue. So it all depends on the project, the place, the conditions. It's entirely situational. But it is one of those things that you're gonna have to keep in mind when you're shooting, just in case. I don't think it'll be anything drastic or anything to really worry about. It just makes sense to protect the camera from the inside so the whole thing doesn't melt. Because let's be honest, this tiny little package right here is shooting 8K raw, which is incredible for a little mirrorless camera. It's magic. It looks like we're shooting on a cinema camera. It looks that good. So we were just incredibly impressed and inspired having that kind of quality in a tiny body like this. Plus getting that dual pixel autofocus, being able to do all of those types of things that we typically want to shoot without having to worry about pulling focus. Like you do on a cinema camera, being able to have that 8K feature, that 4K 120 in log mode while still taking advantage of the dual pixel autofocus system. That's, that is huge. That's massive. That opens up so 
so many doors. You basically don't even need a gimbal when you're using this camera. Obviously gimbals have their place depending on the types of moves and types of shots you wanna do, but for the most part, I always try to get away without having to use one, without having to bring one. An extreme example of that is a few weeks ago, I was hanging out the side of a Razer side-by-side -side with a pro driver up north. He was going like 130, 140 down this crazy dirt road and drifting corners. And I was just hand holding this with one hand because the other was holding on for life. And I was trying to vlog that whole thing with the IBIS, with the image stabilization, I mean, it, it looks fantastic and that's not even in slow motion. I, I don't see the need to even bring a gimbal when you travel or any of those things. It's, it's just so good. So let's talk about the price. You're looking at for the body only, $52.99. Now that's Canadian dollars. That's important to say. If you're watching this anywhere else, do the math, look it up. That is a good price. To get a camera that packs as much punch as a cinema camera in a lot of instances in a package this small. Think about travel, think about portability. You can take this anywhere. This flies under the radar. This doesn't look like you're shooting professional looking 8K raw footage. You get a big cinema camera, you go in somewhere. Sorry, that can't, whatever you guys are doing in here, it's not allowed. It's a, it's a school project. No, it's not a school project. This is gonna get into those places. This thing is portable, it's small. It's inconspicuous. A camera that's over $5,000 is not a cheap camera by any means. That's a lot of money. Given that I think it's warranted based off what you're getting inside this, if that's out of your wheelhouse, don't be worried. There's another option for you. That's the new R6 camera. Now, if you wanna learn more about this and the cost and all the features and things compared to the R5, you can watch this video right here. So the fact now that I can shoot a vlog in 4K at 10-bit, 422 internal, the amount of information that this camera is recording, it looks like I'm editing cinema camera footage. That's because this camera packs so much inside. So I've had people ask like, will you be switching to the R5? And yes, I will be switching to this camera. This will be my new main driver, daily driver, travel camera. If I'm vlogging, if I'm making short films, I'm gonna be shooting them on this because it packs so much in such a small footprint. Print. And there's so many things in here that I've been waiting for in a camera for years. Well done, guys. Seriously, well done. All right, guys, so that is it for me. That's your first look at the Canon EOS R5 from someone that's been using it for a few weeks and had hands-on for a few months now. I hope you got something out of that. I hope that was a good representation of the camera. You got to see some of the specs. You got to see some of the footage used, what it looks like, what it looks like uploaded to YouTube after it's been compressed, all of those things. I hope it was helpful and I hope mostly that you enjoyed it. So thanks for sticking around. I appreciate you watching and thanks to Canon for sending me those cameras early. I had a blast. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. When you hear the word artist, you might think of a painter, a museum, fancy degree. When I hear the word artist, I think of my friends, the local restaurant owner, a little kid sitting under a blanket with a flashlight dreaming of the stars. <laughs>